Thanks so much. I think one of the things the, the roundtable should be thinking about is whether or not we want to figure out a way to get them to do a challenge that would focus on a true integration of, of health literacy. So let's put that on our possible uh, to-do list. And it's now my great pleasure to uh, turn this over to Dr. Um, Alex Christ. And among his other um, activities, he's an active clinician. And, um, and so I think he's going to bring that interesting perspective as well to the topic of patient portals. I'm glad my slides work because I don't want to have to compete with Reed's stand-up <laughs> comedy here. So that's good. So um, yeah, I, I'm a family physician. I'm, I teach at a residency in medical students and I'm a researcher. I'm going to talk a lot about some of our, our research work and we've been trying to work for the past decade with making patient portals uh, more patient-centered trying to create that experience for patients where they can go on and they can see all their health information and it can be translated for them on what they should be doing to stay healthy and to um, uh, follow different guidelines that we're trying to promote. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're studying how to integrate this into care and how we're trying to develop an evidence base to kind of show what works and what doesn't work. And I should say at the beginning here, I have to have a disclaimer, so I'm a member of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, but I'm talking about um, my stuff. I'm not representing the task force for this. And we also have a whole bunch of people that we've been working with, uh, both within our university, but we're partnering a lot with folks at uh, in Oregon and uh, University of New Mexico and the Office of Disease Promotion and Health uh, uh, Prevention. Um, so uh, when we think about patient portals, this was mentioned earlier, this is an important topic because uh, primary care and for that matter specialty care and hospitals have really adopted health information technology. So two-thirds of practices have an electronic health record and they're participating in meaningful use. So 60 percent of primary care clinicians participated in meaningful use in the past couple of years and this means they have to have portals. And so what this means for patients is you might have a portal with your primary care doctor, your specialist, the radiologist, your insurance company, the lab company. I had to register my daughter for a portal for an outpatient surgical center before she had her surgery. So this can be challenging for patients to navigate. And from a patient perspective, there's a lot of things they want to do with portals. So they want to look over their health records, make sure it's right. They want to track expenses. They want to avoid duplicate tests. They want to keep doctors informed about what's going on. They want to move from doctor to doctor and setting to setting. They want to manage their family's health status. They want to get treatments that are tailored to them personally. And they want to manage their health and lifestyle. But let's think for a second about what portals are actually doing for patients. And I think there's great things that are going on with portals, but to a large extent, it's just a window to look into a doctor's record. And doctor's records are written in doctor language, and it's hard for doctors to understand what's in the information and unreasonable to expect patients to understand this information. So you can get in and see a list of your diagnoses, a list of your medicines, a list of your allergies, a list of test results. And there's great things going on with the open note movement where you can even see your doctor's notes. Uh, Medline Plus Connect is allowing uh, records to link this to patient educational informa information. So there's good things going on, but we've got some uh, steps we need to take. Lab reference ranges are wrong. They're going to show you kind of the basic what the worst scenario is. So this is what you might get on what your LDL needs to be. And well, this is true if you've had a heart attack, but it's not true for every patient as to what's normal or not normal. And guidelines are more and more complex. So this is the task force, what they're saying about uh, what people should do for aspirin. So they say, you know, if you're a man 45 to 79 and the benefit of uh, preventing a heart attack outweighs the harms of a GI bleed, you should take an aspirin. Well, that's tremendously difficult for a doctor to interpret, let alone a patient to interpret who wants to know, should I take an aspirin or should I not take an aspirin? Now, in fairness to the task force, they're making information for clinicians, not for patients, although there is more consumer guides that are coming out, like this one for prostate cancer screening. And then doctors' portals are trying to help patients with this. And there's some good things that are going on, but for most of these portals, um, the health systems and doctors have to configure alerts. They're relatively basic. It's things like age and gender, when you had something next, last. And then they say, well, we want to do this every 10 years. So if it's been more than 10 years, there's an alert. And it says you're overdue. And that's the patient education. So we really need more than this. And we've been trying to struggle with how do we help patients really understand what preventive care do they need? And how do we help them to take um, action on this? And we started with a, a series of grants that I'm going to talk about that began back in 2007 
And it's kind of an overwhelming topic to think about. So we were lucky. We, we ran into Linda Harris and other folks at um, Health Finder, and they've done a lot of work on this already. Um, a lot of user-centered design where they work with 700 plus patients and done uh, formative testing and usability testing, uh, some of them low literacy, to try and create uh, general information for patients that they can go and they can search. There's actionable steps like tools and calculators and things that they can do to work on this. It's evidence-based, which we like, like the task force and ACIP and the IOM. And patients can go in and they can tailor it a little. So you can enter your age and your gender. If you're a woman, you can say if you're pregnant. And then you can get lists of all of the recommended preventive services that are covered by the ACA and that the task force and other groups recommend. And the design is based on um, the health literate care model and assumes kind of a universal precautions approach, approach which means it's assuming that um, everyone's at risk for not understanding the information. So the content and the language within here is set up to to try and make it so that anyone can understand the information with the idea that professionals can identify people's health literacy. Even health literate patients um, may take away different meaning from statements than a healthcare professional would want them to take away from this. It's more difficult to understand when you're sick or you're frightened or worried about something. And health literacy is really dependent on the topic and what you're looking at and thinking about. So um, what we tried to do is take this uh, a step further and link into doctor's electronic health records, make sense of all of that data that's there, which is really messy in electronic health records, pull it all out, apply it to national guidelines, and really be able to concretely tell patients what it is they need in patient-centered terms. And we've been operating under this kind of a, 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 a model for functionalities to make IT more patient-centered, where we believe that you need to collect patient data. Um, there's certain things that only patients know, health behaviors, family histories, values, preferences. We need to combine that with clinical information. So when we go for 18 guidelines, we found that there's over 390 some different clinical elements that you need to be able to say, do you need or not need to get this service? And patients can't be expected to remember that information. We need to translate that all into lay language so people can understand it apply it to guidelines to give individualized recommendations, and then most importantly, make the information actionable. Give them tools and steps and things that they can do to actually make changes and improve their outcomes. So we've been trying to do this through an application that we're embedding into electron or patient portals in electronic health records. This is a version where it's sort of freestanding. We modeled after Health Finder, tried to take all their content, apply the clinical information to it, um, so that we actually go from prevention all the way through disease management, which is what doctors and patients need, and we see whole spectrums of people looking at all this information. We try to tailor it both based on patients' preferences as well uh, and how they want to prioritize things, and then we're trying to integrate it into the workflow. So on a simple level, patients can go and they can just see this list of what they're overdue or not overdue for, and it's highly tailored. So, you know, if you have a family history, if you've had the disease, depending on the results, depending on all these other factors, it gives you a different recommendation. And then we try to give individually tailored patient education material modeled after Health Finder, where it's talking about the basics and the benefits, concrete next steps. It's got information and links to apps and websites and tools. And, I often kind of uh, liken it to the doctor sitting next to the patient and saying, here are the things I kind of want you to look at and, and to go over, and it's personalized based on their profile. And as we heard earlier with some of the prior presentations, we've been very involved in stakeholder input for designing this. So throughout the whole process, we have a patient and clinician advisory boards that are designing or are influencing our design iteratively. We have uh, 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 had uh, hundreds of practice learning collaboratives where they're talking about how do they want to use this information, what's important for their patients, how do they integrate it into the workflow. We've got diaries where clinicians and, and um, nurses and staff can enter their experiences with how this is going. Um, we do usability testing, these other types of factors. And then we have open comments for patients using the system, which sometimes can be painful to look at and review. Um, We've been lucky, though, because uh, over the years we've had a, a journey where we've been doing a number of different studies. We, we started out doing randomized control trials and saying, does giving this tailored information result in improvements of recommend, delivery of recommended 
preventive services. We've been able to study can practices field this on a practice-wide level and engage a, a wide range of patients to use this type of a system. We recently had a PCORI grant where we're trying to look at the decision-making journey and trying to get patients information before they meet, need to make cancer screening decisions and see how that influences care and what's happening. And then now we're starting a, a grant with the National Cancer Institute. We're going to try to disseminate this to 300 practices, many of them with low literacy uh, patients, federally qualified health centers, um, inner city Richmond in New Mexico with Native Americans, Hispanic population. And we're going to see if we get the same effects in these different groups as we've seen with other populations. So our experience so far that I'm going to talk a little bit about, and I'm going to jump into some of our key learning points, which I think is important. Um, we've got about 70,000 patients using this in 14 practices, and that number is important because it's, it's, almost, it's almost about 60% of the practices population that are getting on and using this. We've had problems with integrating this into some of the commercial portals. So some of our practices are actually fielding two sites. They have their normal portal for emailing patients and seeing labs, and then they've got this for getting their preventive care. And what's interesting, those practices, um, there's about a third of the patients in the practice portal compared to two-thirds into, into our system, um, which is, is just reflecting some of the information that patients are wanting to see and use and access. So here's some of the things that we've learned over the years as we've been doing this. So the first thing is in our randomized control trial, we found that giving patients very specific tailored information um, helped them to act on preventive care. They were more likely to go and get uh, recommended cancer screening and immunizations. And we saw increases in 12, 16% for breast and colon cancer screening. In some of our practices, this was pretty impressive because they already had a, a breast cancer screening rate of 70% and they jumped up from 70% to 86%. So there's almost a ceiling effect that we see. So we think that this is encouraging. But not only was it important to get the, the patients on board, but getting the clinicians on board was really synergistic. And we saw some magic happen with this. So half of the increase was probably from patient and patient activation. The other half was from the clinician activation. So we integrated this into the EMR, sent all the information back to their clinicians. And 80% of the time, clinicians acted on this information. They would update the records. That was one of the things patients wanted to do, is to maintain and update their records. Um, and then they would um, contact patients, so this initiated some population management for delivery of services and visits and such. We also found that the patient need was very substantial. So in our primary care settings where the bulk of patients are using this system, uh, much like other studies with Beth McGlynn, only about 53% of people, or people are up to date with only 53% of services. But when you look at an individual person and say how many people are up to date with everything, it was 2.2% of people. So that's maybe one of you in this room is up to everything, up to date with everything here. Um, and on average, people needed about 4.6 services. So, and this is A and B task force recommended services. We did a separate study where we fielded a health risk assessment that was looking at health behaviors and mental health issues that were recently recommended to integrate into EHRs by the IOM. So standard things like health behaviors, substance abuse, depression, and these types of things. And we found on average of the 13 items we assessed that five point, people had 5.8 unhealthy behaviors or mental health risk screens that were positive. So this is kind of overwhelming to think about dealing with. As far as our users go, um, our practices that we're integrated in with at the moment, uh, most of them serve higher literacy populations. We do have some that are in more rural areas, um, and we're going to our next phase with some much more disadvantaged populations. But even within this population, we found that a wide range of patients were willing to go online and look at this information. And they're going online to websites, and they can also access this mobily through their smartphones. We are told when we did our grants this would be great for young, um, healthy people who are um, uh, tech savvy, but it's not going to work for older individuals. That didn't pan out at all. Our highest user group was 55 to 65. Our second highest was 65 to 75. Our lowest was 20 to 40 year olds for user groups. Chronic disease seems to drive a lot of use. There's more health needs, and that was some of the age link right there, the chronic disease aspect. One of the other challenges we had is getting the information to patients at the right time. So we tried to engage people before visits and say, go and review this to start thinking about, prepare yourself and be a partner in making decisions on cancer screening. We'd send people alerts. 
And it works, but a lot of times people would go, they'd hold on to that message, they'd go and do it after their visit, and the doctor would get the information after their visit. So there's a whole bunch of cultural changes we have to address to integrate this into the workflow. And then we've been looking at new ways to personalize the content. So as part of our PCORI study around helping to engage them in shared decision making, we had patients go through around um, breast cancer, age to start, prostate <coughs> cancer, whether to get screened, and how to get screened for colon cancer. And we asked them, What's informa what information is important to you? So we did a series of 100 uh, focus groups with 100 patients. They identified the topics that were important. And then they would go and use this module, and patients would say what topics they thought were important to them. And we asked them, how do you want to learn about it? Words, numbers, pictures, or stories? I always hear stories are great for conveying messages, but we're finding a lot of our patients want, want words. They want the basic information. I imagine they want it all. We're going to be looking at, all at this and see what information people access, but trying to think of new ways of preventing, presenting this information. And then I'll close with, um, as I mentioned, we're moving to trying to field this in, in a wide range of patient populations, see if this works in different, um, uh, different groups. And there's some theory that, that if we do this right, it could actually reduce some health disparities. So, um, but that's something that remains to be tested and seen. Thank you.